I'm Marty Stauffer. Over millions of years, man has evolved into the dominant species on Earth. Throughout all this time, we've had a relationship with wild animals. We've hunted and killed them, tracked and studied them. We feared and worshiped them, even named ourselves after them, hoping to take on some of their powers. Although we depend a great deal on modern technology, we continue to depend on our wildlife heritage. Wild animals still play important roles in our everyday lives. For recreation, we admire their freedom. For economics, we harvest their bounty. For science, we explore their mysteries. Each living thing shows us the success of the past and the promise of the future. We are all, one way or another, living with wildlife. Wildlife is priceless and irreplaceable. It renews our spirits. Millions of people rely on it for outdoor recreation, like fishing and hunting. In fact, our original relationship with wild animals was as hunters to prey. Many of us still enjoy the age-old excitement of the stalk and hunt, but in different, more modern ways. What modern hunters capture is not a dead body, but rather the living form of an animal as a lasting mental image, a lifeless check mark, or a photographic negative. This non-consumptive use of wildlife is the fastest growing. Birders and photographers now outnumber hunters two to one. Many people build nesting structures or bird feeders. Some redesign their backyards to attract favorite species. Some volunteer for various projects to aid wildlife. Millions of us, in many ways, go to great lengths to live more closely with nature's creatures. But if we are to continue enjoying wildlife, even more of us need to know how they live in nature, to understand how we can better live together. We must understand the relationships between plants, animals, and humans, the intricate web of the food chain, the delicate balance between predator and prey. None of us, not even the biologists, can know everything about every species. But all of us can get a general idea of how wildlife lives in nature with ecology. All natural communities are complex and interdependent. Plant roots bind the soil, deriving food from it. Leaves, fruit, and dead plants fall to earth and become litter, an absorbent 
moisture holding layer. Animals eat the leaves and fruit of the plants, while beneath the litter, minute decomposing organisms return it to organic plant food. As animals live and die, the cycle continues. Some people are repulsed by the sight of dung beetles rolling away huge pills of manure to bury underground, of fly maggots feeding on a dead deer, and of vultures joining in the feast. But we cannot pick and choose what pleases us in nature. Our repulsion is unrealistic when we learn that these scavengers are working for us as well as themselves. They are a natural sanitation crew at work 24 hours a day. When a creature dies, the scavengers arrive. First, the large obvious ones like vultures and magpies. Next will be flesh flies and carrion beetles. Finally, bacteria and fungi from the soil. Invisible, but very important. The system works and has for a long, long time. But man makes changes, and no form of life on Earth can escape his influence. The dandelion is just one example of natural selection controlled by man, and it happens quickly enough to see. Where they're not mowed, dandelions grow tall. But when man mows an area, he selects against tall dandelions in favor of short ones those under the height of the lawnmower blade. In other words, the short ones continue to live while the tall ones grow only in non-mowed areas or die out. Eventually, even over the course of a summer, all dandelions in a mowed area will grow short. This is natural selection, a species adapting to its changing environment. Survival depends on adjusting to changing conditions by adaptations. Adaptations are specialized behaviors and structures, the spray of a skunk, the tusks of a walrus, the tail and teeth of a beaver. Each of these various adaptations allows the animal to fill a particular place in nature, or niche. The human term for niche would be job. No matter how specialized, each species is part of a community. What it does and how it lives affects all other life forms within its community. Just as we cooperate and compete with other people, so do wild creatures. When several different species try to occupy the same niche in an ecosystem, they compete. Competition may be for food, cover, or something less measurable, but equally important, territory. When one of these, like food, is scarce or highly prized, competition can occur between species that normally don't occupy the same niche seagulls and bears, for instance, or even between members of the same species. Nature is not chaotic, but ordered. Each part does not stand in isolation, but relates to the others around it. This universal law is interdependency. Where 10 or more species are interdependent, the elimination of any one will not be crucial. The very complexity acts as a buffer 
in a relatively simple system where each species plays a major part, the elimination of one could threaten all. In any case, diversity equals stability. But man makes diverse natural ecosystems into simple artificial systems. Our dramatic impacts on wildlife can be seen in the ways we use the land. Forestry, grazing, urbanization, and the most profound, agriculture. In nature, a large area may change slowly and allow wild species time to evolve. Glaciers are an example. Or a natural disaster, like a forest fire or flood, may change a small area quickly, allowing wildlife to move to nearby undisturbed areas. Neither of these safeguards, time or space, exist in agriculture. Clearing farmland changes large areas very quickly. In farming and forestry, monocultures are the rule. Drastically altering the environment by growing acre after acre of only one producer, corn, pine trees, or strawberries that was one of many in a natural food web. The producer's natural enemies find a banquet unequaled in nature. As they feast and step up reproduction, we use insecticides, often killing both our insect enemies and our insect allies. Trapped in an endless, unnatural cycle, we also release poisons into the environment. We can farm better by using natural waste for fertilizer and natural predators for insect pests. We can create some of the stability of the natural world by leaving wild areas between croplands. In forestry, we can use selective cutting, leaving some mature and dead trees as cover and homes for wildlife. It may be illegal to kill an endangered woodpecker, but well within the law to cut the only kind of tree it can live in. Another major use of land is livestock grazing. Because they like the same foods, livestock and wildlife often compete. Competition can lead to overgrazing and poor range conditions. The best way to improve the range and to benefit both wild and domestic animals is to reduce livestock where necessary. In spite of man's activities, a few species have actually increased in number and expanded their range. The coyote, the armadillo, and the opossum. These are rare exceptions. In most cases, Wildlife needs our help to survive. The reverse is also sometimes true. Some of us who have been seriously ill may be indebted to wildlife. A number of chemical compounds from wild plants and animals are irreplaceable sources of medicines and other drugs. An estimated five to 10 million different species of wildlife exist worldwide. Of these, only 1.6 million are even named, and few of these are completely known. Yet all of these species hold secrets and could be living laboratories for our scientists. But if we don't learn to live with them, we may never discover what they can tell us.
Wildlife contributes billions of dollars each year, directly and indirectly, to the economy. Directly, many depend on the fur and food provided by wild fish and game. Guides and outfitters find employment and income. Indirectly, the tourist industry profits. Businesses located near parks and refuges benefit from people's interest in watching wild creatures. But the same kind of bear we may enjoy feeding or watching in the wild may be attracted to our crops. Wildlife is not always an economic asset. Predators sometimes destroy livestock. Wild animals may damage grain fields and crops, costing farmers time and money. Whether wildlife hinders or helps us, we cannot pursue it wantonly. We must follow the law, which is based on current principles of conservation. Conservation, the practice of protecting wildlife from man, is the only way we can live with wildlife and also reap its many benefits. If we follow this ethic, our grandchildren may be able to enjoy wild creatures in their natural habitats. One of the world's most carefully managed animals is the northern fur seal. Exploited historically for its velvety undercoat, it now provides a food source for Aleut natives. Each spring, about a million seals gather at their ancient breeding beaches on the Pribilof Islands off Alaska. First come the large breeding males, staking out their territories and defending them against rivals. By late June, the cows arrive, and within days give birth. Several days later, each cow will be herded into a harem and bred by the harem master. By the early 1900s, the herds were greatly reduced. Today, the kill is strictly regulated. Each year, a set number of non-breeding young males are taken. In the strictest sense, wildlife is unmanageable, and wildlife management deals with human institutions rather than natural ecosystems. Management is an intricate process because of so many variables. One important part is imposing hunting seasons and bag limits to control the number of animals living in an area. We may feel strong emotions as we watch these creatures being humanely harvested. Many feel the harvest should be stopped, regardless of economic necessity or tradition. Many consider the harvest a good example of preserving a species and at the same time providing a source of food and income for the Aleut natives on this remote island. Through the years, 
the dollars derived from trapping and hunting have ensured the continuation of many species. Emotions aside, the fur seals are thriving and even increasing under the current management regime. As long as we manage the fur seal wisely, it will be able to continue renewing itself. Management once meant shoot the wolves and keep the deer so that we can later shoot the deer too. This kind of wildlife monoculture has proven disastrous when herds greatly overgraze their range and become unhealthy. It now attempts to be scientific, even though it is often still subject to human emotions and desires. We are still eager to kill the predators that compete with us. The main reason we must manage wildlife today is because this desire has unbalanced most systems. We expect that somehow we will get a high sustainable yield when in fact, wildlife populations in nature fluctuate greatly. Wildlife management is now trying to restore balanced natural ecosystems with both predator and prey, and to balance the consumptive needs of hunters and fur trappers with the growing non-consumptive needs of birders and wildlife watchers. We now realize Wildlife is much more than just something to harvest. It represents the difference between barren land and rich countryside. As we work to restore our land, air, and water, we must also provide sanctuaries for wildlife. The bluebird does not need as much wild land as the elk for which this area was established but both are essential and are worthy of our concern. The key to wildlife conservation is habitat. It must be restored wherever possible. Quality habitat is vital for healthy wildlife and is rapidly disappearing as we expand with our suburbs, shopping centers, roads, and airports. If a species cannot fulfill its role in nature, it becomes extinct. A final word. In the past, many species were shot or trapped into extinction. Today, the most visible road to extinction is when animals lose their niche. As man's activities destroy wildlife habitat. Because livestock owners often view prairie dogs as a nuisance, they are usually poisoned or shot. They are rarely removed live to other areas. These are an endangered variety found in Utah, being moved for their own protection. Sometimes it seems we just can't live with wildlife. But we must reconsider our self-assumed right to eradicate species that have been here as long or longer than man. By eliminating the prairie dog on which they depend for food and living space, we have also eliminated the black-footed ferret, now the most secretive and probably the rarest animal in America it could soon become extinct. We could easily see the time 
when the black-footed ferret is no longer here to live, hunt, and play. And they are only one example out of thousands. The ways in which we live with wildlife have changed drastically over the years as humans have emerged as the dominant species over most of the earth. Now we must make hard choices and long-ranging decisions about the future of our planet if we are to continue to share it with other forms of life. The choice is simple. We can destroy wild animals and live without them forever. Or we can preserve them and live in harmony. We humans have changed the face of the earth to suit our needs. Of course, that's impossible for nearly all other species. So we should try to live in ways that provide for their needs also. Only our long-term commitment to the protection of wildlife habitat will ensure their survival and will mean that we can continue living with wildlife. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.